Hello and welcome everyone to the um, webinar hosted by the Maternal and Child Survival Program on Community Health Information Systems and Data Use, Learning from Africa and resource, Resources for Practitioners. My name is Melanie Morrow and I'm the Community Health and Civil Society Engagement Team Lead on MCSP um, and um, I'll be moderating today's discussion. Um, the Maternal and Child Survival Program is USAID's global flagship uh, program for preventing child and maternal deaths. Um, and today we'd also like to thank the Health Data Collaborative um, for their contributions to some of the resources that will be presented um, and to the presentations themselves. I'd like to um, start by going over the agenda. Um, you can see that we'll be having um, three presentations followed by a Q&A time at the end. So we request that participants um, well, while participants can enter um, questions into the Q&A dialogue box um, at any time, we will be holding the response period until the end. Um, our first presentation will be on integrated community health information systems, um, presented by Scott, Scott Russ Patrick, um, followed by the, uh, a presentation from the Ministry of Health in Liberia on their community health program, presented by Jerome Corva, and then um, lastly, a presentation on supporting communities to use health data, a resource package that um, is available for practitioners to use. Um, so just a bit about our speakers. Um, Scott Russ Patrick is the DHIS2 Analytics and Data Quality Product Manager on, for health information, the Health Information Systems Program at the Department of Informatics in the University of Oslo. Um, his responsibilities include supporting um, corner case DHIS2 implementations globally, creating the software development roadmaps for data quality and analytics, and coordinating advanced DHIS2 trainings. Scott is also a University of Oslo point person for community-based information systems and logistics management information systems. Uh, Jerome Corva is the Monitoring and Evaluation Officer um, for Community-Based Information Systems. Um, he's the focal point for Community-Based Information Systems um, for, in, for Health Monitoring, Evaluation, and Research Unit in the Liberia Ministry of Health. Um, so Jerome leads the um, Community-Based Information System, including managing and coordinating the monitoring and evaluation of the National Community Health Assistant Program of Liberia. And Jerome Corva has accomplished the establishment and operationalization of the community-based information system, among other m and &E functions. And um, lastly, Jennifer Yorkovich is a global health and data expert who has been leading technical assistance to community-based health programs around the world for over 20 years. Um, she has contributed to a number of activities and products on MCSP as an employee of ICF. So without further ado, um, we will move now to our first presentation. Okay, this is Scott here with the University of Oslo. Thanks for the opportunity to present um, and thank you for the introduction as well. I am trying to go to the next slide. But it doesn't look like I have the ability to go to the next slide. Can you try one time? No. no. Okay, well, we can just do this a little bit more manually then. That's fine. Technology is why we're all here trying to figure it out. So what I'm going to do in my presentation is just cover a few um, key things here. Uh, what the University of Oslo is doing in terms of implementation, development, as well as research around community health information systems. I want to talk about a little bit about the stance of the University of Oslo and how we're kind of uh, working with the DHIS2 community around community health information systems. Uh, we've just wrapped up a very large research uh, study on the current state of community health information systems in West Central Africa. And then we have quite a lot of solutions that have been, uh, we've been working on from that research as well as for the last um, decade or so around community health information systems, both technical as well as on the human element of things. Next slide. 
So where we kind of currently sit, I think a few of these bullets here, this is a little bit of background, are relatively familiar to everyone. But what we see uh, is that there are a lot of ML health projects going on. Most ministries don't have the ability to manage or control all of these various ML health projects. Um, to the point that, you know, we all hear the term pilotitis a lot. We're all from, probably familiar with the Uganda M Health Moratorium back in 2011. But essentially, um, it's a little bit, it's still the Wild West of community-based information systems with little ministry oversight. And what little interoperability there is, is often custom and too expensive for ministries um, and even donors to maintain long-term. Next slide. So essentially why are integrated community health information systems necessary? Well, I'm gonna steer your attention over to the diagram that we have on the right side of the slide. And when we talk about information systems, or national information systems, we talk about the national HMIS, Health Management Information System. And we consider the community health information system a layer uh, of that. So we have in the HMIS, we have district information systems, we have facility information systems, and below that, hopefully, we have community health information systems. These community health information systems are feeding data up, but they're also integrating across all the various mHealth tools that are being used um, uh, for the, very diff the various projects, programs, uh, localities within the country. Right now we have about 27 countries we know using DHIS2 as their community health information system. And this is the model that we are trying to uh, encourage um, and assist them in implementing. Next slide. Essentially all of our guidance that we have from the University of Oslo and from the DHIS2 community uh, in large is wrapped up into a single document. It's the DHIS2 Community Health Information System Guidelines. Uh, it was developed over the course of 2017, 2018 with 14 ministries of health, a lot of NGOs, UNICEF, HDC, and Global Fund. And it includes dozens of use cases. It includes seven chapters. It's actually about 200 pages. Um, and it goes kind of A to Z on how to uh, assess, develop, implement, and sustain a community health information system using DHIS2. It's by far the most comprehensive and practical guidance that we have for any programmatic area in which DHIS2 is being applied. Next slide. One of the most important parts of that document that I was just talking about is chapter two. Chapter two is um, a guidance on how countries can conduct a micro assessment of the current state of their community health information system. Um, if you're familiar with the uh, HMN assessment that was done um, fairly broadly five to 10 years ago, it's very similar to that. Essentially, there are five thematic areas. There are 58 questions, and each question has um, predefined answers. Now, what countries do is they go question by question. They find the answer that best suits their context or their current scenario. <clears throat> Excuse me. And each question has a value applied to it. They're then able to aggregate the values up. And um, this is very useful in kind of getting an overall score, but it's also very useful in doing this repeatedly so that they can monitor their progress over time. So the questions range from highly adequate down to not adequate at all, as you can see in the picture here. Next question, or next slide. So who does the assessment? Well, es essentially the assessment is done by representatives from every level of the health system. So you have community members themselves, community health workers, chiefs, religious leaders, parent teacher associations, mothers groups, um, community health workers, of course. Then you have everyone, you have the key people at the facility, obviously a selection of each one of these, um, district, province, national level, and obviously international as well. Now, you may be thinking that this is an ideal group of people to get together, logistically speaking, at, in any country. That is correct. It is very difficult to get adequate representation from all of these different levels within the same room and able to talk to each other in a productive manner. But with UNICEF's help, we were actually able to do this in 17 countries. So next slide, please. These are those countries. These countries all did this early 2018. Um, so there has been quite a lot of progress made in each one of these countries since they've done this assessment. Some of them have done the assessment more than once by now as well. Um, but essentially we are able to have all these 17 countries, I won't read them out to you, but they're listed there. And they were able to then present the results 
when we had a community health information system academy, essentially a large regional training for Western Central Africa in Dakar in May of last year. And over the last year, we have been um, pouring through those results and we have um, written up a academic article or a journal article on it, which will be published in the Journal of Global Health in the next couple of weeks. So there is a peer reviewed publication of the results coming out in the next few weeks. Next slide, please. So let's look at what some of the results were. And I think some of these results will actually run counter to what a lot of the you know, general uh, long held beliefs are about community health information systems. Here are those five thematic areas that I was talking about. We have reporting structure, standard operating procedures, system design, feedback, and government ownership. It's quite clear that government ownership is by far the lowest scoring um, thematic area. Um, then we have followed by standard operating procedures. That's probably, these are probably no surprise to most folks. Um, system design and development coming in third, reporting structure a little bit better, and finally feedback was actually the best scoring thematic area. Please note that none of these are actually really even above 50%, meaning that they didn't, that most countries um, gave themselves uh, you know, scored themselves very low, essentially. Um, when you have these kind of self-assessments, there's always a case to be made for reporting bias. Most reporting bias would skew towards something that's a little bit more optimistic than what the reality is. Here, what we're seeing is that, you know, that, that the scores are all really quite low. Uh, UNICEF then conducted a validation exercise where they confirmed that these scores were uh, representative of what they, what was, they were actually seeing on the ground. Next slide, please. So beyond the numbers, let's get let's talk about some key takeaways. The biggest one that was um, a fact that's worth really driving home is that prior to conducting the assessment, essentially in all of these countries with a couple of ex uh, exceptions, there was essentially no engagement, communication between the people who were developing the systems and the community health workers and key community stakeholders themselves. Obviously, you can't make a system for people if you don't know those people. So that was so it's obviously pretty pro uh, problematic. Data feedback to community health workers was also appreciated and, and community stakeholders was also really appreciated as being very important. Everyone understood the principle of it, but it just really wasn't happening and still is largely not happening. And then there's the old adage that in Africa, there are more cell phones than, the, than there are latrines. That certainly may be true, but to get an information system, you need a lot more infrastructure than just cell phones. You need reliable electricity uh, power supply, you need mobile network, you need ability, people relatively close to be able to fix technical problems. No, if, you, if you're missing one of those things, there's a you know, strong likelihood that your information system will struggle. And what we see is that infrastructure beyond just access to cell phones is still a major problem. Next slide, please. A couple of more um, takeaways here is that, and I think, don't think this will be a surprise to anyone, but governments are severely under-resourced to be able to support these large community health information systems, especially ones that integrate many different technologies into a single platform. Um, essentially what this means is that it becomes easier for NGOs, donors, implementers to be to build parallel systems much more quickly than it is to do the systematic changes and overhauls that are necessary to actually form an integrated community health information system. So this is both a symptom and a cause of this kind of pilotitis, you know, uh, um, too many redundant parallel systems. Um, and then finally, complex interoperability systems are very ex um, expensive and difficult to maintain. Coming from the DHIS2 technical side is it's, there are very few examples where DHIS2 has been able to form generic interoperability with uh, community health reporting tools at local level. It's not because of necessarily there's been customization on the DHIS2 side, but we do find a lot of customization on the reporting tool side. Of course, you can make a generic interoperability uh, layer, uh, but when there's customization on one side, that generic interoperability layer usually no longer applies no longer works properly. So it just requires additional customization. Of course, that's expensive and it ties you into a single development team, which is unsustainable. Um, yeah, next slide, please. And then finally, the biggest takeaway was that there is, well, there was a very strong desire from all of the various countries, that, the 17 countries that participated, that they want control over the HMIS reporting tools. They all need that data into their HMIS for planning, 
um, disease surveillance purposes, logistics, uh, uh, commodity allocation. All this community data is extremely important to the country for planning purposes. And if we actually want data use, then we have to put the data in a place in which it can be seen together. If it's not being able to seen together, then uh, you're always going to have fragmented decision making um, and efficiency is going to be low. Next slide, please. So how can we address some of these challenges? I'll quickly run through a few of these. Um, I think it's very important to point out that mHealth implementers should be concerned with uh, integration or exchanging data with the HMIS from the very beginning. I think in this industry, we have a, a, a big tendency to say that if it works, then I'll worry about communicating with the HMIS. But if that's your approach, you've already kind of set yourself up for failure. You need to worry about communicating and, and sharing data with the HMIS from the very beginning of the project, uh, you know, before pilot phase, um, uh, to really have long-term success and sustainability. Ministries, donor and donors alike, should also demand that implementers use technology that follows global standards for data sharing. So, you know, we, you've probably heard about these before: Open APIs, ADA, ADX, HL7, Fire. These are the global standards for data exchange not just within our sector, but in all sectors. Um, and, uh, and if your software that you're implementing doesn't, apply, doesn't adhere to these, then you're going, to have a really, you're going to really struggle to have data exchange between multiple systems. The use of global public goods is always a great approach, DHIS2 being one of them. That doesn't lock you into a, typically a single development team. It means that the software that you're using is going to be typically of higher quality and more sustainable, less resources to apply to it. It, you, you do have some economies of scale there for the global public goods softwares nowadays. Um, you know, and th all this to be said that the ministries have to own the process. They have to have the policies, the guidelines in place to dictate this. It's not necessarily in an implementer's uh, short-term interest to necessarily follow any of these points that I've made, laid out. They're typically, the, the implementation cost becomes more expensive. Uh, but ministries just, it needs to be their control, their mandate. Um, and you're seeing ministries take more control and implement the standard operating procedures uh, uh, to make sure that implementers are following this. Next slide, please. You know, I think it's, it's always worth in saying that you cannot force technology or infrastructure does not exist, um, which we see a lot of still, a, a lot of smartphones being put into places that don't have elect reliable electricity. Uh, if you don't address electricity, then that smartphone is not very much more useful than a hammer. Um, and so, you know, th that has to be, a, a, you know, a, a very realistic assessment of what's actually on the ground available. Uh, data feedback is critically low. Um, and we have seen through many examples now that if you're not feeding a lot of data back, data back down to community health workers, to the stakeholders, if the system doesn't provide them more than what they put into it, then it's likely going to fail. Um, and it has to be a, a, you know, a conscious decision that the developers and, uh, and system administrators have to have engagement with the end users. It's not going to happen naturally. They don't live next to each other. They have to be put into the same room. That requires money. That requires planning, workshops, what have you. Um, and then finally, the, the, the diagram on the right here um, is a little model that we made up, uh, putting together the three things that everybody wants, scale, low cost, and complexity. Um, we would love to be proven wrong about this model, but so far we haven't been, uh, at least we haven't seen any examples of where we, we have been. But essentially we say that you can only pick two of these. If you want very high scale and you want low cost, which is basically everybody, then the complexity has to be very low. And when I say low complexity, what I mean is critical indicators reported uh, not too frequently, right? The reporting burden for the person putting the data in is very low. The administrative burden is very low. You, you don't have a lot of server space. You don't have a lot of internet traffic. Um, if you want to track every single HIV patient, every newborn child, and every household, um, then you're going to have to build a very large complex system. And that's just going to take a lot of money to maintain over time. Next slide. I just want to talk about some of the, uh, quickly here, some of the technical things that we've put into DHIS2. Next slide. Community health workers are a big focus of, of our development. Here, I'm just gonna show you an ex a quick example of where um, Ghana has gone with their implementation of the community health information system. You see the Ghana Health uh, DHIS in the center there, and then you see the proposed CHIS on the right. 
what they're building is a separate instance of DHIS2 to be the CHIS. That makes a lot of sense as they're doing inter, uh, going through kind of the development of it so that they're not disrupting their own HMIS. Next slide. We appreciate that everything has to happen in mobile um, for community health workers. So just like you see with a lot of the other uh, tools out there that are for community health workers, a lot of we're building in a lot of uh, functionality for pictographic um, selection, patient um, uh, portals, uh, automatic referrals, just to make, you know, make the workflow, make the data selection, make the data entry process much more easy. Uh, for community health workers. Of course, all of this is customizable in your own DHIS2 instance. Next slide. Finally, we talked about feedback a lot. It's very important to get the feedback out, get the data out of DHIS2. Here's just two examples of where DHIS2 can be configured to basically to send automated alerts, both email and SMS, based upon any data that's entered at any point, and that alert can be sent to anyone. Essentially, total flexibility on who receives what notifications. Uh, the left is a picture, as an example of an automatic email uh, with a dashboard being pushed. People check their email much more often than they check their dashboard. So let's send the data where they're actually uh, spending their time, which is their email, uh, as well as uh, some data quality alerts. Next slide. This is my last point here. We also are developing a brand new dashboard uh, app. And it says Android app here. It actually won't just be for Android. We're using a new technology called Progressive Web Apps. This will mean it will work on Android, iOS, as well as Windows platforms. Um, and essentially, it's a, it's, it has all of the functionality of the DHIS2 dashboard in the web browser, but just on your cell phone. So I think that's my last slide. I can hand it over to Jerome now and start answering questions. If you have any questions, please, uh, uh, you can post those, and I'll be happy to answer those. Yeah. Um Thank you so much, Scott. Um, and as Scott said, as we're um, queuing up uh, Jerome's presentation, please um, feel free to enter questions via the chat box. So it's a written um, Q&A and, &A and um, we'll, be, we'll be answering the questions at the end of the three presentations, um, but feel free to enter questions um, at any point. Um, so it looks like we're, um, we're ready now for Jerome Corva's presentation on the experience of community level data use and integration into the broader health information systems um, in Liberia. Jerome. So Jerome. Thank you. Uh, my name is, yep. I'm here. So I'm Jerome Corva from the Ministry of Health of Liberia. Uh, like said, I will be presenting on the experience of community level data use and integration into broader health information system. Click the slide. Start clicking. Sorry, slide. Trying to go to the next slide. Not right. Okay. No, I'm not. Okay. So let. Liberia Health System is premised on a multi-tie system of service delivery consisting of uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary levels. And we see that uh, promoting physical health through uh, prevention, including strategies for making community service accessible is uh, one of those for the primary health system. And there come in also the community health system uh, which is still around, uh, I mean, community health assistance, reaching to the population that are hard to reach, that is those ones that are one hour away from the health facility, that is five kilometers from the nearest health facility, and having an integrated and standardized national level community health package for uh, community health program. Can we go to the next slide? So in Liberia, about 1.2 million of people live five kilometers away from the health facility. Uh, this is because these are communities that are really hard to reach and they are not easily reached with health services because of distances. Uh, in 2016, the Liberian government launched the NCHA program to increase access to 
essential health services. Uh, and the service package include uh, curative and preventive services. The curative services around the ICCM, that includes the treatment, the identification of treatment of malaria, diarrhea, and pneumonia cases. The preventive include health education, screening for community cases, making referrals, counseling for hygiene, vaccine compliance, monitoring and tracking, as well as default uh, tracking for TB and HIV, as well as preventive for um, the distribution of those essential commodities, uh, family planning, the condoms, the, uh, uh, the, the, the oral contraceptives. Right now we are piloting the use of Sinopress in one of our 14 implementing counties. We, uh, the CHA also uh, promote the use of uh, mosquito nets. So based on this system or this uh, service delivery package, the underlining um, forces are, uh, I mean, building, I mean, a motivated workforce, uh, community security, HRS, uh, all those underlining uh, factors that are considered into the service delivery package. Can we go to the next slide? So uh, this presents the different stakeholders within the Liberian Ministry of Health Community Health Program. So showing a hierarchy from the top to the lowest. So when I say the lowest up to the level of the community, so you have the Liberian Ministry. So this structure also gives you the different um, coordination mechanism, the different feedback mechanisms that are uh, in the system as well as those one that promotes data use. So you have from the national level, uh, the Ministry of Health, you have coordination, technical working group, uh, QRMs that are held, uh, which link the different civil society groupings, different line ministries and partners that are supporting the implementation. So, I mean, these are meetings where uh, data use as well as program review, taking uh, actions for implementations uh, are held. So at the county level also, uh, the county health team is where the community health program or all of programs for Ministry of Health is being operationalized. And you have county health board meetings as well as the quarterly review meeting. So in the uh, county health board meetings, these are chaired by the superintendent, who is that local chief at the uh, sub, so the counties at the sub-national level. So for national, you have a sub-national level within our geographic uh, system in Liberia. So the superintendent who is that you know, chief or that leader for that sub-national level at the county level, chair that uh, county health board meeting as well with other line ministries, civil society, and other key stakeholders within uh, the health system. So data use as well is, is, is being practiced in those meetings. Uh, you have quarterly review meetings as well at the county level that involve those facilities, the districts that are within that county meeting to also review the data and also take programmatic action. So the district level, this is one of the weakest level we have in our system. And uh, currently the ministry uh, decentralization plan really have more plan on strengthening the district health teams. So there you, we intend having district uh, coordination team, though uh, this is not functional in all of the counties. Currently, we only have this established in three of our 15 counties. Uh, so there you have district commissioners, the paramount chiefs, as well as other leaders that are part of uh, this structure. Then you have uh, the health facility level, which is, I mean, some of our strong uh, systems we have currently. You have the health facility who uh, is headed by the officer in charge. There is also a community health services supervisor who uh, work with all of the community structures, the different community health uh, workers to be able to promote uh, uh, community health program at that level. You also have uh, the health facility development committee to so that facility. So the health facility development committee is that. Uh, is that body that really support the facility 
and it comprised all of the communities that are within that catchment facility represented into those meetings, as well the facility uh, with the OIC and the CHS is making uh, data available in those meetings and the communities themselves taking action for those feedback they receive from the health facility. At the community level, you have uh, the community health assistant who is, uh, I mean, implementing this service package. You also have uh, the community health committee. So the CHC, uh, also like the HFDC is supporting the CHA as the CHA implement their service package or their tax that they have to do in the community. In fact, before a CHA is uh, selected, it is this community health committee uh, who are as well elected by the community members that nominate uh, those lists of potential CHAs who sit in literacy tests uh, at the facility and whoever pass, I mean, is considered as a CHA for that community. So this CSC support the CHA why they implement uh, health services in that community. So these meetings are also attended by the CHA and they make presentations of data uh, to those meetings. So CSCs also leave from the community that they are in and also go to the HFDC meeting at the facility level and also get feedback from the uh, facility at the, I mean, at the HFDC level on data uh, that is being produced from all of the communities and also those ones with the other at the facility to also be able to uh, inform some of their actions they take in the community. Next slide. So, based on dates, uh, Liberia developed a tracking system, the MNE, where we develop uh, reporting tools, we develop uh, the automated system in DHIS2. So, before the the introduction of the uh, seat, uh, of the community program, Liberia had this uh, full system layer that is from national, county, district, and facility level. But with the coming in of the community level, the fifth layer was uh, introduced. So community currently is that fifth layer within our uh, health information hierarchy. So we also had SOP and guideline developed and distributed to all of the uh, different levels within the system. We also have program reviews, uh, both at county and national level for reviewing of program. And uh, in this review, data is also the center for uh, those presentations. So that made. Next slide. So uh, routine program monitoring is also being uh, implemented. So we have the implementation fidelity assessment that is ongoing. Uh, we also have program perception studies. So uh, the, the fidelity assessment is actually looking at the design of the program and how it is being implemented. So we visit the different players, interview uh, community level, uh, as well as the household level, and they provide their feedback as to how implementation is going on. And these findings are presented, are also giving back to the CSC as well as the HFDC at the different levels. We also have program perception studies. So this is where we listen to the people themselves, uh, giving their view as to how <laughs> they feel about the program. And most of the time, we have people going into the communities, interviewing people, asking them how uh, they really think this community health program is being implemented, whether they are interacting with the CHA and how the CHAs are also interacting with them. And we have wealth of uh, data on this and, I mean, quotes as well from individual community members on how the community health program is also uh, being implemented in their, account, in their communities. Also, our service data is being stored into the DHIS too. Next slide. So, uh, like stated, right, our health information system, now the fifth layer, the CBIS, the community-based information system, have several tools and data use uh, ledgers that we have at a different level. So those ones that you see in the green are those ones that have and also used by those communities uh, where they are generated from. So you see that there are some of them generated from the community, 
they are sent to the facility, the facility use them, also make a report to the district and also to the national level. So you see that the BHI S2 is being used at district, county, and national level. So let me also say this, it is not all of our districts that are really strengthening to use uh, BHI S2. There are some with poor internet connection and also uh, wherein district health teams are, are not also being established. I mean, when I say established, where you have a fully functional district health team. There are some of those districts that only have uh, one pressing uh, MOH definition that would not be a fully established uh, district. So that's why you see it combined here with county. Only three of our counties really have functional district health teams at their, uh, in their counties. So you see that we have large amount of data reported. We also provide implementation feedback. We have dashboards in DHIS too. We also make uh, uh, at review meeting, we also share this data and also through emails, uh, provide this data to the different levels as well. Next slide. So in 2017, the Liberian Ministry of Health did a data quality assessment, uh, data quality review rather, and uh, there were some interesting findings. So this was really looking at uh, the facility level because at that time the community health program had just been uh, operationalized. So we really, there was this uh, gradual implementation from one county to the next, so we did not have uh, the resources and the time to really uh, visit as well community level. But what we did was a sample of uh, facilities and we saw that uh, in terms of analyzing and using of data in Liberia, we saw 38% evidence of facilities that were using data at their level. So, and so what we were doing is we asked whether the facility was using data and what were those evidence, either by, uh, I mean, having some of their graphs and charts in the facility or reviewing their HLBC meeting minutes and seeing whether they reported those data back to those HLBC before we could get that facility as using uh, and analyzing data. And we saw an evidence of 38% uh, data use. So, yeah, so that was, I mean, by and large, the challenge of data use really experienced across the whole country. So only 38% of our facilities really had this data use uh, practice. Next slide. So though at facility level, we have some challenges, but uh, from the program perception, from uh, the fidelity, from the different uh, stakeholders, uh, quarterly review meeting, coordination meeting, we've seen some evidence of data use. So uh, these are questions we really ask. How data use has influenced program planning policy and program design? How data use has influenced quality of care? How data use has improved collaboration? And what has been the role of feedback? So we try to answer this question in the coming slides. Next slide. So uh, there was some time in 2017, what we saw was that uh, commodities for CHAs was not being uh, provided adequately to this CHA. So we saw a lot of stock out at the level of the community. So what we did as a national, a national level based on the feedback we got from data, uh, there was a decision from one of the KRM uh, and coordination meetings that 20 to 25 percent of facility stock be allocated for CHA uh, based on those CHA commodities, uh, and also we we also saw that uh, based on data, some of three of our counties also try to improve the capacity of uh, the workforce. Uh, that is, we identify some capacity gap and the feedback was provided to those counties and they were able to retrain some CHAs in those counties. The next slide. And excuse me, Jerome, I'm gonna to have to yeah. ask you to conclude with this slide, um, unfortunately, to save some time for the last presentation. Okay. So, 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 please, so continue here, but we'll have to ask you to wrap up. Thank you. Uh, okay, so you like, 
the initial slide that I presented with the different hierarchies and the different structure, uh, the community health committee is that lowest unit. So in these CHC meetings, these are questions that these CHCs tend to answer based on the data that they receive from the CHA and whatever uh, information needs that they have, uh, the data that they generate, the CHA also provide those feedback to them in those meetings, as well as the support and uh, guidance from the CHSS school comes from the facility level. The next slide. So uh, I'm going to end here with this slide. So you see that the community health assistant, uh, from their routine tasks that they perform, provide this data to the CSC. So for example, in an event where uh, there is an incident of diarrhea in the community or from one other community, what they do is that the CHAs will provide this data to the CSC meetings and CSCs will also take action on what to do. These communities also have local laws uh, that they have. So for example, a child should not go about open and defecating in the community. Whoever is found have some penalty. So a CHA would normally go around and make sure that these local laws are also adhered to. So in the event someone violates and the CHA try talking to those persons, they also provide this you know, kind of feedback to the CSC meetings. So from uh, the Liberian presentation, though we also have quite a few slides, but because of the time, uh, I would like to close up with this. Thank you, Jerome. Slides. Thank you. Slides. Yeah, and we will be making um, the full slide set available. Okay. Go ahead. Our, our next presentation is from Jennifer Yorkovich. Jennifer, please go ahead. Okay, thanks. You can hear me? Yes. Great, okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Jennifer Yorkovich, an epidemiologist and data scientist at ICF. Today I'm describing the work of many people at MCSP and at the Health Data Collaborative, and you'll see their names at the end of the presentation. This brief introduction to the resource package summarizes their work over the past couple of years or so. Let's see if I can advance. Okay. So, by way of introduction to this package, how it came about and why, we know that community-based interventions are gaining recognition for their contribution to improved reproductive, maternal, neonatal, or newborn and child health programs. Um, I think Scott said community is the new facility. And so it's important to collect, analyze, and use data generated in communities. And this resource package focuses on supporting those communities to use their health data. Let's see if I can. Yes. Okay. During the 2017 Institutionalizing Community Health Conference, countries expressed the need for comprehensive resources, tools, and guidelines on community-level RMNCH data use. And so a working group at um, MCSP developed the Supporting Communities to Use Health Data resource package to address this need with input and review by the Health Data Collaborative Community Data Subgroup. All right, so the objectives of the resource package are twofold. One is to provide guidance on the core elements and steps to strengthen communities' capacities to collect, analyze, and use RMNCH data for action. And secondly, to provide links to existing tools and resources pertaining to data use at the community level, including data analysis, interpretation, and decision-making. In our, the intended audience, includes program managers and organizations, governmental, non-governmental, community-based, faith-based, and others that work with communities to strengthen their capacity to collect, analyze, and use their data. 
I think Scott also noted that data feedback to community stakeholders, while recognized as important, is rarely practiced. And so we hope to increase that practice with this guide. And there you see the link at the bottom. You can find the complete package there, the MCSP website. And again, these slides will be made available after the presentation. So the scope of this package, it uses this definition of data use at the community level. That's when data and information, formal and informal, are regularly expected, analyzed, interpreted, and used for decision making by community actors to monitor and manage performance, to track service quality and use, and to identify community needs, health status, practices, and trends, finally ensuring shared accountability. Focuses on strengthening the use of data by community actors. It does not include guidance for higher levels. So guidance for facility-based health workers or district managers are not part of this uh, package. Guidance for policymakers seeking to make community-based policies is, is not a focus here. And neither is the use of survey or census data collected by actors who are external to the community. Okay, so I've lost the ability to advance the slides. Here we go, structure. Um, the, the package is 33 pages with three annexes, and it's designed in the format of a how-to manual. It comprises five modules. The first is about engaging data users and producers. The second is about conducting data assessments to improve data use at the community level. The third is building and strengthening core competencies for data use. The fourth is about supporting communities to translate data into action. And the fifth is about ensuring systems and policies that support sustained community data use. Okay, so I'll briefly describe each module. The first about engaging data users and producers reviews different types of community stakeholders and the importance of engaging them in the community health information system by reviewing processes and providing templates for collaborative mapping and stakeholder engagement. So the main idea of this chapter is to identify key actors, why it's important to engage them, and to conduct a mapping and analysis of stakeholders. So here I've put just a snapshot of an analysis matrix that's included in the annex. Um, you see there's a table uh, with a listing of the names of stakeholders, their description, their potential role in a particular issue activity, level of knowledge and commitment, resources and constraints. This annex, uh, the annex where you'll find this also includes an engagement plan that you can use after the analysis. The second module is about conducting assessments for improving data use at the community level. It builds on the stakeholder engagement process described in module one to outline the importance of identifying stakeholders information needs, providing guidance for prioritizing information needs, and identifying potential sources of data that will yield information and improve the availability of data. Additionally, an initial assessment can identify common barriers to data use and opportunities to improve data use at the community level. So here in this snapshot, we see uh, one of the tables included in the guide. This helps you uh, describe different types of data. So there we just see a bit of service delivery data and data for accountability. Um, provides definitions and then examples of actions to encourage community use of these different types of data. Let's go to module three, building and strengthening core competencies for data use. This module describes processes and tools for data collection, management, analysis, presentation, interpretation, and finally using data for action. And there we see a picture of um, an example of the community bulletin board from Save the Children's Work in Ethiopia. Um, we highlight in this section uh, data visualization as a powerful way to build capacity for data analysis, for presentation, uh, for interpretation, and for use. Um, I think Jer Jerome's presentation has some dashboards in it um, that you'll see, and uh, he also talks about review meetings at the community level. Uh, this module has more examples of those and their related processes. Module four, 
goes into supporting communities to translate data into action. Um, this module addresses the impact that community level data can have, specifically how these data and information can be used to spur community action. Um, this chapter will describe different ways to facilitate discussions that can move teams from data interpretation to planning, which is really where and how data are used. This snippet we've got here um, shows a report from the community-based impact-oriented approach. Many of you may be familiar with CBIO. There's a reference for that, as well as other approaches in the manual. Um, some other approaches described in this chapter include community action teams, quality improvement teams, and community action days. And our last module about ensuring systems and policies to support sustained data use describes how data management and supervision systems can support community level data use. And here I just have a snippet of a table explaining approaches to incorporate community data use at all levels of the health system. Uh, the full table has five elements along the side. Here we just see two indicators and processes. And then these different levels across the top, national, subnational. Um, and health facility catchment areas. So while this guide, this resource package, is mainly about community level data use at community level, we recognize that that will not happen without a supportive health system, which means appropriate policies and practices at other levels of the health system. And that's what's described in this last module. So here are um, the people who worked on this, large team at MCSP, and then expertise from members of the Health Data Collaborative. Uh, we're also grateful for that. Um, so the resource, if you have questions about the resource package, you can contact my colleague, Riti Hobson. There's our information. And then we have these resources that are forthcoming and will be available on the MCSP website a national community health information systems in four African countries, descriptions and lessons from the field, um, and MCSP briefs on community health contributions, multi-country assessment from those countries listed there. Okay, thank you. Jennifer, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, we have just a, a few minutes here at the end to um, take some of the questions that have been coming in. And I do want to uh, reassure people that we are um, noting all of the questions that are being entered into the chat box um, and anything that we are not able to answer during the allocated time here um, verbally during the webinar um, that the um, all of the presenters are um, also answering the questions in writing so we can circulate the written responses to all of the questions that come in um, afterwards. So um, in the, the time that remains, let's take a few of these um, questions. And I think we'll start, um, uh, Scott, with a question for you. So going back to the, um, the first presentation. Um, and the, I guess, let's see. Um, Scott, there was a question here um, asking specifically about the, the Venn diagram and sort of the, the choose to directive. Um, and a question as to whether or not um, um, the diagram that you showed would be different if one replaces the low cost circle with cost effectiveness. Um, is it possible that increased complexity increases cost effectiveness and that scale is necessary for cost effectiveness? Um, what is your sure. what is your take on that? No, that's a very good question. You know, that diagram was based upon a preponderance of evidence. Now, certainly it is subject to change based upon as these systems grow and mature and develop over time, you know, hopefully there can be based upon those three things of complexity, scale, and low cost be some sweet spot that develops. Now, in terms of cost effectiveness, there is certainly economies of scale. As these, in, as these systems increase both geographically in the number of users, programmatic coverage, maybe something starts with malaria, but then it goes into water and sanitation, and then it goes into HIV surveillance. Um, and, um, and as well as complexity. Now, you know, the, the, the amount of server space, just technical, uh, you know, cost requirements, when we get down to the brass tacks of things between a system 
that has 30,000 users and captures data on um, maternal and child health is you don't require that much server space, to be honest, to also add on additional programmatic areas. Um, but it does require more administrative costs. Um, and I think administrative costs are kind of that hidden thing that never goes away um, and only continues to increase. Um, you know, one good example is Datum. Datum has, uh, is the HIV reporting system for the, for the US government. It has 60 administrators full-time nearly just managing that database. You know, many of these national systems actually have more data than datum, but they maybe have just two or three people and that have a much more, uh, much bigger administrative workload. Um, so they struggle to keep up with that. Um, I think that a new um, model could be added that would include cost effective, effectiveness. I would hesitate to add it to that model because cost effectiveness is, is a little bit more of a spectrum, I would say. Uh, that can go up and down based upon the, the those various other dimensions that are that are that are put in there. Hopefully, that kind of answers the question. It's a very good prompt for me. I think we can go back to the drawing board a little bit and build in something that includes cost effectiveness. I think one thing that's really important to talk about is kind of the spectrum of complexity. I mentioned a couple of examples there. Um, I'm more than happy to talk to anyone, especially if you're using DHIS2 for this, about what is a complex system and what are the long-term costs of implementing that kind of technology. I'll be very frank and honest with you. Um, and, uh, and, uh, but there is definitely a broad spectrum in terms of complexity. Our motto here at the University of Oslo is keep it stupid simple or keep it simple stupid, KISS. <laughs> um, and the, the, the systems that have lasted the longest and been the most successful are typically the ones that keep it as simple as possible. Great, um, thank you, Scott. And um, you know, it was it was great to hear um, your presentation, Scott, with a really like global picture um, in terms of the um, the architecture of the systems and the the findings from the multi-country um, assessment that was done. Um, let's shift now with a few questions um, for Jerome. Um, Jerome, it was great to. Um, to hear in, in detail about um, Liberia's system. And um, I, I, again, um, some of the slides that you weren't able to get to, we will be very happy to um, share with participants afterwards. Um, there was a question specifically for you, Jerome, um, asking if you had a sense of the main challenges that are precluding facilities from analyzing and using data. Um, and a related question about, um, uh, with a, someone writing and wanting to know about the process of engaging private facilities and any successes and challenges related to that. So two questions related to the engagement of facilities with the community health data. The first, the issue, the challenge with uh, the issue of data use uh, at a facility level, some of two challenges really stood out. Uh, which were the stock out of standard reporting tools at the facility level uh, was, I mean, the major challenge that we saw in most areas that really did, did not uh, use uh, uh, data and also uh, analyzing data because they had to do improvised ledgers which did not have the standard format for the Ministry of Health. And some most time, uh, collecting those needed information on those improvised ledgers did not really meet quality. So we also saw that uh, staff attrition also contributed. So when a staff leave and a new staff come in the facility, it takes a little, I mean, it takes time before even uh, that staff having an understanding on how the reporting process work and how uh, they really uh, manage the quality of those data at uh, the community level. So oftentimes, you will see that mentoring is the only way that that staff gets to be trained from you me, true supervision, which most times do not have, uh, is limited due to this time of those national and counter level uh, staff who go into the facility to do the mentoring. Mm -hmm. So the second question with the process of engaging the private facility. So the Ministry of Health do not have uh, uh, I mean, any different process with engaging private and public. I mean, the same communicating through the county and the county's engaging 
uh, all of those facilities that they have within the county. The only challenge we've had is that because this private, uh, because public facilities are accountable to government and it is government that pay them their salaries and incentive, so more of time they will respond, you know, to the standards from ministry compared to those private facilities. So in the private facilities, you normally see that they have their own system, uh, most time different from what ministry recommends. So, I mean, there are those challenges. Even responding to communications from central level to those facility is most time a challenge. Yeah, those are really challenges we've seen with private facility. Great. Thank you, Jerome. Um, and I just want okay. I, I see that there is a question here, um, like specifically about the availability of the resource package. Um, and I believe that the, uh, the, the URL for that um, on the MCSP website was included in the slides, but again, we'll be um, circulating um, and making available access to the presentations and the, um, it, so that you would be able to follow up on the URL specifically, um, but it is in the MCSP resources section of the website. And some of the additional resources that were mentioned will be available there as well when they're posted um, in the coming weeks. Um, and we have a, um, a question here. Um, I, I guess I would like be open to, to any of the presenters who'd like to respond to this, um, acknowledging that like given the limitation of skilled human resources in remote rural areas and high demands for skills in multitasking and the available health personnel, how, how would you ensure an effective uptake of the resource package for supporting communities to use health data? Um, so I, I suppose that that is, um, would be directed uh, toward uh, Jennifer, if it's asking about the resource package specifically, but it could also be applicable to um, uh, uh, Jerome as well, if you have thoughts about um, the, the rollout of, um, of packages uh, at, at the country level. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Millie. Um, so our intended audience is program managers and, and organizations that may be working on health programs and communities um, and how they can, as a start, um, help build community capacity to use the data um, that not only their programs generate, but that al also the health data within the, the community. So that's part of the CHIS there. So I think we envisioned this package would be initially used by those programs. Um, how about um, Riti or Melanie, you've also worked on this package. What are your thoughts about that? Um, well, I think that um, certainly one of our thoughts is that there are a lot of opportunities for implementing partners to be working hand in hand um, with the government counterparts. And I think that's certainly something that implementing partners are um, look, part of the reason why they're brought in and are you know, keeping an eye on what the, uh, what the capacity is um, on the ground and are looking for opportunities to build that capacity. Um, and so I would think that um, that that a, a resource package like this in places where it's felt that there's not the existing capacity to apply it, um, that it would could be a resource that an implementing partner could use with the government if they felt that it was, um, a, 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 assuming that community level data use um, is, a, is a priority there, which I think those of us who are on this webinar would agree um, is, is something that's, um, uh, that, that is something that, that is important and worth prioritizing. Yeah, and it may take some effort to create demand mm -hmm. for it, which we address in, uh, in module one about engaging stakeholders to create the, the demand and the desire to use community level data. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I think we'll take um, one last question here. We're a, a few minutes over. Um, so Oh, sorry. So Hello. Yes. Yeah. So I'd like to address uh, the initial question. So let me also say this: uh, in Liberia, currently we are developing a strategic 
I mean, it's still in the draft stage on how we can uh, digitize the training curriculum and have it on the mobile phone uh, so the CHA can listen to the different resource materials that they, they have from the paper form so they can see and listen to it uh, while they are uh, in their communities. So, I mean, that is a strategy currently we, we're developing and, and trying to work on in Liberia. Mm -hmm. So it's called, it's called the CHA Academy. Okay. Thank you, Jerome. Um, and so our, our last question here that we'll um, address live um, is um, directed towards you, Scott. It says, great to hear about progress on community DHIS2 progress. You mentioned Ghana using an instance of DHIS2 for its community HMIS. Do you have a sense of how many countries are institutionalizing DHIS2 in this way? Are there others that are building community health modules right into the national DHIS2? That's a very good question. <clears throat> um, we, we have communicated or have, have provided direct support to about 27 countries uh, to build their community health information system into DHIS2. Um, there could be more. We do not have commun direct communication with the majority of countries implementing DHIS2. Um, or certainly the vast majority of NGO or donor implementations. That's very much by design. We don't want you to have to be dependent upon us to use DHS2 successfully. Um, so, so if you know of others, if you have any questions about any of them, our engagement with any country, please feel free to ask me that. Um, I'll, I'll let you know exactly what we have been done, uh, what we have planned to do. The, that being said, is it advisable to build the CHIS directly into the national HMIS from the very beginning? Well, the reason I showed Ghana was because Ghana has a very large national HMIS, very complex, thousands of users, lots of org units, a lot of data being reported into it. They made a very prudent decision in separating out the community health information system in the initial stages of development and implementation because you do not want to build additional complexity into the HMIS. Um, which could potentially disrupt data flow, data use. Um, I mean, you're making massive, you would be making massive kind of architectural changes and modifications to the HMIS if you just started building an entire CHIS directly into it from the very beginning without any testing, without any knowledge of where it's going to go. Uh, I think that would be dangerous. Uh, I would advise countries, uh, implementers, to stand up a separate instance of DHIS2 using the same organizational hierarchy, same authority, same metadata, all the way through just basically a clone of the HMIS, and then start building the CHIS into it. A safe place, we call it a sandbox in the, in the development, uh, the, the software development place, or community, and, and that's where you can test everything. You can even do your initial piloting and implementation in that sandbox. And then as long as it is, it still stays a, a clone of the HMIS, eventually when your CHIS becomes stable, uh, well, well adopted, data use is high, user acceptance is high, then you can transition it into the HMIS if you want. Um, of course, setting up interoperability between two generic DHIS2 instances is very straightforward. Uh, so you can still have that data flowing. Uh, even if you have two separate instances. They can also be hosted on the same server so that you don't necessarily have to even get more hardware. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, if, if anyone is at this, this kind of critical junction, uh, again, I'm happy to answer any questions um, and, 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 and give, give advice. Um, it, it, is a, it can be a very dangerous thing though, just to set the record straight, to make massive architectural changes like building a, an additional layer into your HMIS unless it's been thoroughly tested and had good user adoption. Great. Thank you, Scott. So what I hear you saying there is that while um, one would want to keep in mind the community health information system and how it will be integrated um, from the beginning, that it, for technical reasons, um, it's best to develop it sort of in parallel or separate and then to plan how to integrate it after, yes. um, <laughs> uh, after all of the, the bumps have been, been worked out. Right, that's exactly right. Okay, great. Um, well, um, thank you again to all of our presenters. Thank you to um, everyone who's been on the line and um, submitting questions. Um, and again, we'll be making the, the presentations and um, written responses to questions available afterwards. So thank you everyone for joining us and we'll sign off now. <laughs>